Okay, so uh, today we'll talk about leveraging CV 2015-7547 uh, for full ASLR bypass and remote code execution for fun and profits. So first, uh, who we are? My name is Nadav Markus, this is Gal De Leon. Uh, we are both security researchers at Palo Alto Networks at the R&D centers uh, located in Tel Aviv. Our main focus is vulnerability research, exploitation, and reverse engineering. Uh, we also develop uh, exploit mitigation for the TRAPS endpoint solution, uh, and we enjoy security in general. So first of all, a short introduction about uh, the vulnerability itself. Uh, the vulnerability itself is in glibc. It wasn't discovered by us, it was discovered by Google Project Zero around three months ago. Uh, Google released a Python-based crash POC, but they didn't release a POC that allows you to control the instruction pointer and no SLR bypass to speak of. So this presentation will focus solely about exploitation strategy and uh, uh, gaining full code execution. So first of all, let's take a look at the vulnerable function, getEDDR info. This function is used to resolve a hostname and a service to an IP address. Now, the out parameter, which is type address info, is later used for usually connect or bind. It will contain the IP address that which, uh, which was resolved. In order to resolve the hostname, several DNS queries might be performed, usually over UDP, but sometimes over TCP, as we will see in this presentation. Uh, the vulnerability itself is a classic stack overflow uh, when handling malformed DNS replies. Now, it's important to note here that this, this specific code wasn't compiled with a stack canary or cookie, but uh, using our presented uh, attack technique, one could uh, bypass the cookie if one was present. Now, getDDR info has a lot of different code patterns. And the, the vulnerable code pass is reachable if and only if the hint parameters that is applied to it contains the AI family as AF unspecified. This parameter means that we don't care about the type of the hazards that we resolve. It can be either IPv4, which will result in an A record sent over the wire, or quadruple A record, which, uh, of IPv6, which will result in quadruple A record so sent over the wire. Um, it's important to note that this is the most common use case. Uh, as usually, you don't care about the network layer upon which you communicate with the server. You just want to communicate with it. For example, an SMTP server that, that would want to relay an email does not care whether it gets the next email, the next server's address via uh, IPv4 or IPv6. So let's talk a little bit about the bug. Well, let's say that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that an SMTP server tries to relay an email. In order to do so, it used getEDDR info to resolve the uh, corresponding host. Uh, so a call to getEDDR info is performed. This uh, will result in several things. First of all, a DNS query over UDP port 53 for both the A record and quadruple A records is sent. In order to accommodate the incoming response, the glibs C code uses alloca to allocate a stack buffer. Uh, of size 20, 48 bytes. Now, usually this will suffice for responses, and therefore this is kind of an optimization, because the malloc procedure is a little bit more expensive in terms of time, and using alloca is simply a matter of decrementing the stack pointer with a specified amount. Um, as we can see, uh, this pointer is stored inside hostbuffer.buff, and a weak host buffer, which we later see how they are used in the process of exploitation. Now the malicious attacker responds with a valid uh, response that uh, uh, oh. yeah. so, responds with a, a DNS reply that con has two important characteristics. First of all, it is too large in order to fit into the buffer. Now it's important to note here that this is not where the stack overflow is. Here it correctly allocates a new buffer on the heap using max UDP size, max uh, UDP packet size. Uh, and in addition, uh, the truncated flag is set inside the DNS uh, response headers. Now, as we can see from uh, the RFC, a compliant, cli a compliant client should re-query the DNS server over TCP if the truncated flag was uh, <coughs> set. Uh, the glibc client, being a compliant client, tries to do so. So 
once again, both the A and quadruple A records are sent over the wire, now this time over TCP. Now, first of all, the attacker responds with a valid A record response. Here, the heap malloc buffer is used correctly, and it's important to note here that here, actually, the response is valid, the IP address is valid, this will be later used in the process of exploitation. And now, here comes the stack smash. The quadruple A record is malformed. It is way too large in order to fit the 2048 bytes. So we have this classic stack overflow or stack smashing attack. Uh, you might ask yourself, why is there a vulnerability here? Because we malloc a larger buffer. Well, due to internal mis buffer mismanagement, the stack buffer is still being used, but the size variable, which contains the size of the buffer, was incorrectly updated to the size of max packet. This gives an attacker the ability to overwrite max packet minus 2048 bytes on the stack. Well, let's, for the sake of simplicity, assume that the response buffer is adjacent to the return address. This means that uh, this is, of course, a simplified uh, view of the, the buffer as we'll, of the stack, as we will see later. And so now the attacker can uh, control the rip when we return from the function. However, we do exploit this uh, vulnerability on a modern operating system, which contains modern uh, exploit mitigation uh, which in order to deter attackers, namely DEP and ASLR. So we won't be able to execute arbitrary data, and in addition, we don't know where anything is located. We don't know where the modules are located, we don't know where the stack is, we don't know where the heap is. So if we would like to employ ROP, which is the standard technique in order to bypass DEP, data execution prevention, uh, we need to find our gadgets. We need to find uh, addresses which contain executable code. So there are several generic techniques for SLR bypass. And we'll go over this uh, briefly, and we will say, and we'll uh, explain why we chose not to use them or why they were not applicable to our specific use case. Uh, first of all is the non-py executable method. Uh, the non-py executable method relies on the fact that one compiles the main executable of an, a, a Linux program, passing down the minus fpy flag without passing the minus fpy flag to GCC. This results in a non-relocatable uh, module, a main executable, which provides the attacker with reliable addresses with executable code. However, we ex wanted to achieve remote code execution, which means that we would want to exploit uh, internet-facing uh, application. This means that we, at least what we thought, we uh, assumed that the application would be compiled securely with the minus fpy flag as they should in order to reduce the attack, mitigate, reduce the attack uh, possibility. And in addition, it's not very fun uh, to use constant addresses. Um, another type of uh, ASLR bypass technique is the read memory vulnerability. This kind of vulnerability allows us to read memory from inside the target host. Now, uh, the packets that we receive from the client, the queries, do not contain any information regarding the internal memory layout of the machine. We cannot infer from them directly where the stack or modules are loaded. And transforming the stack overflow uh, attack into real memory vulnerability was not so straightforward and we didn't even know if it was possible at all. Maybe we can do it without crushing the machine. So we decided to skip this uh, technique. Another technique that can be used to bypass SLR is heap spraying. However, there are two problems with this specific technique. First of all, we are trying to exploit a 64-bit machine. This means we have 64-bit uh, virtual address space. Uh, this means that we will exhaust the physical memory way before we will be able to get a reliable address with our data. However, let's assume that in some magical way I was able to achieve a reliable address with our data. We still have DEP enabled. So this data won't be executable, so we are back to square one. We still uh, need a way to, uh, to bypass uh, DEP and to find the uh, ROP gadgets. So uh, me and Gal felt kind of lucky, so we thought uh, maybe we just guess, maybe we'll get lucky. All right, so um, let's step back a little bit and talk about some uh, of the billion blocks we uh, assume for this exploitation. Uh, first thing, let's 
uh, talk about the uh, way new processes are created uh, under the Unix environment. Uh, the standard way of doing so is to use the, uh, the fork system call. Um, so basically, if you look at this code snip, uh, what's going to happen is that a, a process will run and then fork itself, uh, creating a new child process. Uh, and the newly created child process is sort of a cloned version of its parent. Uh, the only thing that differ the two is uh, the process ID, uh, the PID uh, of the process. Uh, so what's going to happen is basically that uh, the parent process uh, PID will be greater than zero, the return value of fork, and will execute the first block. Uh, and uh, the child process PID will be zero and will execute the second block. Um, so the two processes share many characteristics. Uh, just to name a few, uh, the memory layout of, the, of uh, both of them is the same, uh, which means that the loaded modules are uh, located at the same addresses. Uh, this is a fact we'll take an advantage of uh, later. Uh, the register state is the same, uh, the stack is the same, uh, even the heap is the same, like uh, all previously allocated uh, heap blocks uh, would be at the same addresses. Uh, so you'll later see how this can be abused. Uh, and another thing uh, we didn't talk about previously, uh, we assume uh, for this exploitation, for this specific exploit, uh, that the attacker has the ability to answer arbitrary DNS queries performed by the victim. Um, talking about all the possible ways of doing so is really out of scope of this presentation. But just to name a few, uh, the attacker could acquire uh, some domain and if he has the ability to uh, make the client to query, uh, to use getADDR info with this domain or its subdomains, then uh, it would be able to, uh, to supply arbitrary DNS reply. Or for instance, a local R poisoning attack uh, between the victim and its DNS server uh, will allow us to answer arbitrary uh, requests. And there are many other ways of doing so. Uh, so just take this for granted for uh, this exploitation. Uh, so let's discuss the exploitation technique. Uh, this slide is very important. Uh, we assume that the attacker has some way uh, to affect the uh, targeted uh, victim uh, daemon service uh, in such a way that it can trigger a fork operation of that service remotely. Uh, let's just take a real life example for that. Uh, let's say that the uh, process that we try to exploit is an HTTP server. Uh, so that HTTP server would listen on port 80, for instance, uh, on the victim machine. Uh, then the attacker will perform an HTTP request uh, to, that vic uh, to that process, which will cause the uh, daemon process to fork itself in order to, uh, supply to handle the attacker's request. So we assume that uh, the, the target uh, daemon we attack is some sort of, uh, of this kind of a daemon, uh, which the attacker can trigger the fork remotely. So attar the attacker triggers the fork, uh, which creates a new uh, process, uh, let's say with the PID of 3312, it doesn't matter which one. Um, and then uh, we assume that the child process will call getADDR info, uh, specifying the AF unspecified flag. Uh, so it will perform two DNS queries, one for IPv4 and I for one for IPv6. Uh, so the addresses right there on the, uh, the left uh, are uh, just, it could have been any address, uh, depending on where glibc was loaded to. Uh, but let's assume, for instance, that the uh, call instruction to get it in your info happened to be in address uh, 121200 uh, uh, C, and that the return address from get it in your info would have been at 121012. Uh, Could have been any address uh, depending on uh, where glibc was loaded to. Uh, so then the implementation of the get it in your info function will perform the DNS queries, uh, which the attacker will reply. Um, so we'll, the attacker will perform, uh, will use the bug as we showed previously. Uh, setting its own IP address uh, for the TCP A request uh, for the valid response and sending a malicious response for the IPv6. Uh, it will set the return address of get in your info to an arbitrary address it chose. Uh, let's say, for instance, uh, for this example, for uh, 10, 10, uh, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. Uh, could have been any address. Uh, so, what will happen next is that get in your info will return to this address and uh, this will crush the child process. Uh, reason why uh, we will encounter a crush 
uh, could be a seg fault, just trying to uh, execute an address that isn't mapped or address that isn't uh, a valid code page. Or even if it is a code page, uh, it could be just uh, trying to execute some invalid opcodes. So uh, sooner or later, the child process will crash. Uh, so the attacker now uh, triggers the fork again. Uh, and the daemon service, of course, didn't crash. The only process that crashes is the child process. So again, the daemon will fork itself uh, and call get a DDR info. Uh, the important thing is that uh, for both the child uh, processes, the one that previously crashed and the, the newly created one, the address of the instruction uh, for calling get a DDR info and the return address of get a DDR info will be located at the same addresses. Uh, the reason why is the fork operation. Since they were both forked out of the same uh, process, uh, their other space remains the same. So uh, the attacker will again reply uh, the same way, uh, but this time let's assume that it shows the right, uh, the correct return address for get DDR info. Uh, so what happens next is that we execute the test uh, EAX, EAX code and continue uh, the execution of the child process as uh, we should have been. So then let's assume the child process uses the connect function, uh, supplying uh, the uh, ADDR info structure uh, returned from get ADDR info as an argument, uh, which will cause the uh, child process to create a new TCP connection to the attacker's IP address. Um, so basically what we do here is that uh, the attacker gains the ability to en enumerate and check whether the return address is set for get editor info is indeed the correct address or not. Uh, if he set it to a wrong address, the child process will crash and he won't get a new uh, TCP connection. Uh, and he can exclude this address since it will never be the correct address since all the child processes are cloned out of the same uh, demon. Uh, if he guesses the address correctly, you'll get a new TCP request, and now he knows that uh, this address resides within the libc module. Uh, basically, he leaks it. So um, we could have just enumerated, theoretically, uh, all the possible addresses, uh, return address of get ADR info, uh, but in 64-bit machine, this would be uh, two, almost two up to the 64 bits, uh, if you ignore some uh, bits that you always know their value. Uh, so this is not really feasible within a reasonable amount of time. It would take years to enumerate. Uh, so we decided to operate this approach a little bit, and Nadav will tell you about it. Uh, so as Gal said, it's not feasible to enumerate 64 bits of entropy. So we thought maybe we could break down the original problem into sub-problems, smaller sub-problems, which will be easier for us to solve. Well, this is exactly the byte-by-byte -byte approach. We don't have to overwrite the RIP completely when overwriting the return address. Because we know how much we overwrite and we know how much to uh, write into memory in order to, uh, to write the entire address, we can just overwrite just a portion of it instead. This means that the remaining bytes that were set correctly by, to uh, by the correct code uh, flow will, be set still the, will still be there. <clears throat> Let's, for example, assume that the ret original return address is 12.12.0.12. Now we overwrite the return address, uh, just the least significant byte of it. As you can see here, in memory, it will be stored first the least significant byte, and here the most significant byte. In this instance, we override, overridden the least significant byte to be zero instead of 12. So what do we gain from this? Well, basically, we've transformed the victim into some sort of oracle. The oracle responds, uh, we give him a byte, and he responds whether this was part of the original address or not. We can iterate this process several times in order to leak the entire original return address. So, for example, let's say the attacker sends a, a bunch of A's followed by a zero, overwriting the least significant byte of the return address. The application will crash. Therefore, the attacker can infer that zero is not the uh, least significant byte of the return address. It iterates its process, trying with one, two, or three, until it gets to 12 hexa. Uh, it's important to note here that for all the previous attempts, it did not get a response. Therefore, it was able to infer this. Now, however, as it overrides with the original byte that was in the least significant byte, the program continued to execute normally. 
and therefore we do get a response. It attempts to connect with this uh, resolved IP address. Okay, so we have gained something. Now we can use it, this newly acquired knowledge in order to override the next byte. So in, this time the attacker will send a bunch of A's, followed by a 12, which you know is indeed the least significant byte, and then zero. And then uh, it keeps uh, doing this process, and the, at most it will take eight times uh, 256 uh, attempts, as this is the maximum uh, uh, combinations for a byte, eight bytes for the length of another. Uh, and this approach works marvelously for our own compiled application, but this wasn't enough for us. We wanted to find a real life, potentially exploitable application. Now, as we mentioned, in order for our attack technique to work, the requirements were to able to trick three or four remotely, and that fork will use GetDDR info, the ch uh, child process, and we had to have some sort of indication of success, whether we crush the machine or not. Now, it means that not every application that contains both fork and GetDDR info is vulnerable. For example, it might invoke GetDDR info from the parent daemon, in which case the oracle will die immediately and we won't be able to predict the bytes. Uh, it might not uh, get us uh, back uh, an indication of success. We, we might not use it in order to connect, which is not highly uh, likely. So we search codesearch.debian.net, uh, which indexes the source code of around uh, 18,000 packages, uh, intersecting the requirement for both fork and get your info, we remain with uh, 1,300 potentially exploitable uh, applications. So Gal and me uh, were faced with this really boring and uh, long list of applications to go over their source code and to inspect. But then a specific application uh, caught our eye, and I want to show you why. Hey, listen. Is your mouth tiny and small? Then why don't you come down a little bit? Little man. Where, where the food is tiny, it looks like regular food, but really tiny. You can put it in your mouth and eat it. Nothing gets stuck in your lips. It's just tiny and tiny and fits right in. <laughs> fits right in. Little pants. We got tiny lasagna, tiny pizza, tiny pie. Mmm, little tiny fried eggs. Oh, shit. We got tiny people. Little pants. You hungry? Come on down. Little pants. Eat some shit, you stupid bitch. <laughs> just kidding. As you can see, this is uh, from the show Rick and Morty, which we really like. Great show. I recommend it for viewing. Um, so the obvious candidate for inspection was Tiny Proxy, uh, which did uh, prove to be a viable candidate for exploitation. So Tiny Proxy is a lightweight HTTP uh, proxy server. What this means, uh, it caches uh, HTTP responses uh, from HTTP servers in order to reduce bandwidth consumption or to reduce latency, you name it. One installs it in its organization in order to improve performance. So let's uh, go over the flow of the normal user connecting to a tiny proxy server and how it serves it. Well, let's say our user tries to connect to www.somewhere.com. The tiny proxy, in order to serve the client, forks itself. And now it needs to retrieve the contents of the HTTP, right? It needs to connect to some uh, HTTP server. Well, in order to do so, it uses getDDR info, specifying the A if unspecified inside the hint parameter, resulting in both the A and quadruple A records which are required for exploitation to be sent over the wire. After getting the response from the DNS server, tiny uh, proxy connects on behalf of the client to somewhere.com or trace the HTML or whatever, and pass them back down to the client. Now, let's uh, recall the requirements for an attacker in order to uh, successfully exploit uh, an application using our attack methodology. The connect can be used to trigger a fork and the invocation of GetDDR info remotely. Now, it's important to note here that GetDDR info is invoked inside the child process. The, the parent process will never crash due to our attempts. In addition, we need, must have an indication of success. This is achieved by the connection uh, to the HTTP server. An attacker can just point to the DNS records, the valid A records that we send, the attacker can send uh, uh, before sending the malformed quadruple A record, to point to itself. If it receives a connection, it knows it was successful. If it didn't, it failed. So that way our oracle is formed. 
So now it's game over, right? We can just leak an address inside Libsy, calculate the offset, perform a normal, normal rope chain, and uh, everything's sweet. Well, no, we lied a little bit. We don't really yet control the instruction pointer. The stack buffer is not adjacent to the return address, as you can see from this diagram. There are several local variables on the way, and unfortunately, some of these are pointers pointing to the stack. When these pointers will be the reference, if they contain an invalid address, we will crash. If we crash, we don't get the return, we fail. So ASLR is enabled, so we can't hard code these pointers beforehand, or we wouldn't have any problem in the first place. So what we do? How do we leak these stack pointers? Well, we simply employ the same technique. We use the byte by byte approach in order to leak stack pointers and stack addresses in addition to the glibc's uh, base module address. So let's take, for example, the first sec fold that we encountered. As you can see here, the offending instruction is inside ms name ntop, which is a for worker function, internal worker function, invoked by uh, get addr info. Uh, and we can see that the offending instruction is move byte ttr rbx seal. This instruction attempts to write a single byte to the address pointed to by rbx. Now, as you can see from the following GDB instruction that uh, we uh, executed, uh, rbx contains a bunch of A's, which is clearly not writable. Um, it's important to note here that rbx originally pointed to a stack buffer. It pointed to a, a location on the stack. So using the byte-by-byte -byte approach, we can leak this original address, yes? But not so. Not, we have a, uh, because this uh, pointer is used only as an output buffer, it is not being written to the written form uh, afterwards, any writable address will suffice. This causes us to lose some granularity, and we won't be able to uh, leak the entire address. We won't be able to leak some bits of it, as we will see in the next slide. As you can see here, the cut of proc PID maps shows us where the stack begins and ends. As you can see in this example, the size of the stack is uh, 21 hexa pages with uh, 33 pages, uh, which is way larger than uh, one page. Uh, as I said earlier, it doesn't matter what RBX points to it. It has, just has to be writable. So because the stack is always will be larger than one page, we can't leak the lower 12 bits, which are an offset inside this page. Let's, for example, assume that the original uh, pointer contained, uh, contained the black uh, marked uh, address, and the attacker guessed AAA is the lower 12 bits. It doesn't matter what he puts there, because even if he put there 0, 1, 2, CDC, whatever, it will always be writable. So we can't infer the original value of RBX, but it's good enough for us right now we, because we just want uh, to be able not to crash, so we will get to the return instruction and execute the return uh, controlling grip. However, there are occasions when we do need uh, the exact pointer to be leaked. Let's, for example, take the second sec fold that we encountered. Uh, here's a small uh, C code snippet from the libc code. As we can see, hostbuffer.buff, which is equal to all host buffer, are allocated on the stack. Um, and then, it, uh, after some uh, internal work is done and before returning to the user, uh, hostbuffer.buff is compared with all host buffer. And if they are different, a freeze performed. And why is that? As we mentioned earlier, as an optimization, the buffer is allocated on the stack, but internal worker functions might allocate uh, another buffer on the heap if the, if the supply buffer is too small. So hostbuffer.buff is an in-out parameter that might be replaced. In order to detect so, uh, the C code stores the original pointer inside a weak host buffer and compares them. If they are different even by one bit, uh, a free is performed. However, this is really bad for us because we will pass an invalid heap pointer to free, which will cause an abort to be raised. Because free, when uh, uh, being uh, supplied with invalid heap chunk, will crash with an abort. So we will crash before the return. We can't overwrite rip. I mean, we can overwrite rip, but the return won't be executed. Uh, as you can see, this C code was translated into the following assembly snippet. Uh, RDI is read from the stack, which is under our control due to the overflow. 
Uh, it's a quick reminder, we must overflow uh, the contents of RBP plus PTR because we have to overflow all the way until the return address. Uh, and then it's compared with R14, which uh, is equal to Oikos buffer. As you can see, if they are equal, we skip the free that crushes us. So we need somehow to make RDI uh, equal to R14. So what we do now? Do we employ the same technique of the byte by byte approach? Well, we could, but this would mean we would have to enumerate a lot of bytes. As we overwrite around uh, 3,000 bytes on the way, this would uh, make the exploit take way longer than we would like. So we search for a way to optimize this. Uh, an important, uh, distinct, uh, an important uh, observation is that the stack will remain identical between different forks. Uh, because we crashed the application so quickly after, uh, sorry. because we crashed the application so quickly after invoking getDDR info, the same amount of stack space will be allocated for each daemon. As you can see here is the tiny proxy daemon which forked to several child processes. Each one of them attempts to allocate uh, a buffer stack, and we see that they get the same return address, the same uh, stack address uh, for a rig host buffer. So hostbuffer.ptr is the same between all executions. So what we can basically do is use a constant offset from the stack base. Because the same amount of stack is, uh, is allocated for, uh, per run, we can just calculate beforehand the offset between the hostbuffer.buff or rig host buffer to the stack base and uh, hard code this offset and add it to a leaked stack base. So now we need to leak the stack base. So let's see how we manage to do that. Well, first of all, it's important to note here that we used our previous primitive, the move RBX seal. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, the only restriction upon this address is that it has to be writable. So using this uh, primitive and two uh, uh, characteristics of the stack base, we were able to leak it. Uh, the characteristics are that first of all, the stack base is aligned to a page boundary. Using the previously leaked uh, stack pointer, arbitrary, previously we uh, leaked uh, an address within the stack, uh, an address within the stack boundaries, but we didn't know uh, exactly what uh, the original point uh, of the X was. We just aligned it to a stack boundary. And then we kept uh, enumerating, adding one page at a time. Now, another interesting property of the stack base is that it will be the first non-writable address adjacent to the stack. So now our oracle will respond, yes, this is the correct address when we do crush. In, uh, unlike before, we, it responded, it is correct uh, byte when we didn't crush. So we try with uh, zero, then 1,000, 2,000, and all these times we do get a response. Um, when we do get a response, we know we still haven't uh, hit the stack base, and the first time we reach a non-writable address, which is indicated to us by a timeout, which uh, then the application won't uh, connect to us due to a crash, uh, we infer the stack base. Um, mm -hmm. So is this really game over now? I mean, we have leaked the stack base. We calculated beforehand the offset between the stack base and each stack pointed buffer. So we can fill in all the local variables leading up to the stored return address. So it's pretty much a piece of cake from here, right? Well, wrong again. <laughs> okay, so um, we assume that the offset to each and every local variable from the stack base would remain constant. Uh, but we found out that this is not the situation. Um, each time we restarted the tiny proxy service, uh, this offset happened to be uh, different. It did remain the same between all the forks uh, each time we, we restarted the daemon, but it did change for the parent process uh, each and every time. So uh, we try to figure out what's the reason for that, and the reason why is uh, that code snipped from uh, the Linux kernel. Uh, this is an archi architecture-specific uh, code uh, that runs every time you create a new process. Um, basically what it does, uh, if ASLR is enabled, as you can see, uh, it generates a random offset and uh, push the stack uh, by that offset prior to running the uh, first function, uh, the start function 
uh, of the newly created process. So uh, let's examine this uh, uh, this picture of the stack, for instance. So when you call stack, uh, you know, when you call the start uh, function, instead of having the stack pointer pointing to the stack base, it would be uh, to the stack base plus uh, some random offset. Uh, so this offset happened to be only nine bits uh, due to this modulo operation and the fact that it has to be aligned to a pointer. Uh, so basically, what we did is just enumerate it. Um, we first leaked the stack base, uh, then we calculate uh, the offset to uh, the local variables as if this random offset created by the Linux kernel was zero. Uh, and then we started to enumerate from there uh, the, uh, another nine bits. So basically, uh, if we get uh, the correct offset, uh, we would skip the free block and don't crash, and otherwise uh, we would. Um, so, uh, from now, uh, basically, we gain control over the RIP, uh, returning from gated area info, uh, after we leaked all the local variables on the way. Uh, and we now just imply the same technique in order to leak the return address of gated area info as uh, we talked about before. Um, after we do so, we want to uh, create a rope chain, to construct a rope chain to bypass uh, that. Uh, so basically what we do is we compute uh, from that return address of get area info, which is within uh, the libc module, the module base uh, to uh, the libc base, and then just uh, find offsets to the uh, instruction gadgets that we need uh, in order to uh, run on code. Just employ the red to libc technique. Uh, but the thing is that we don't know what's the libc version uh, of the uh, victim. Um, so each one of these versions, since it's compiled differently, it has different code, uh, would result in different offsets, uh, both to uh, the base of libc from the return address of getting your info and uh, to uh, the gadgets that we need. Uh, so basically what we do, uh, we just took all the vulnerable uh, versions of libc and compute the offset to libc base and to the gadgets for each and every uh, one of these uh, libraries. And then we just enumerate. Uh, each time we guess the wrong libc version, we will crash uh, the child process. And when we get the correct uh, version, we'll just uh, run our uh, red to libc attack and uh, run our uh, exploit code. Um, so just as a quick review, the complete uh, exploitation flow is uh, we leak an arbitrary stack pointer uh, at the first uh, segfault we encounter. We then leak the stack base uh, using the same crash. Uh, we then leak the random stack offset uh, in order to, uh, leak, uh, to set the right value for all the precise stack variables. We then leak the return address of getting your info, enumerate all the uh, libc versions until we successfully exploit. So we'll now show a demo uh, of this attack. Uh, but uh, live demos sometimes don't work. <laughs> So we chose to show you a video of a demo, but if anyone is interested or doesn't find this satisfying enough, you're more than welcome to uh, come afterwards and we'll show you uh, the live demo. So, um, yeah, if you can help me with that, that will be great. So, uh, first thing we do is we restart the tiny proxy service. Uh, just in order to have a fresh start. Uh, we then run a PS instruction. Do you guys see the screen? Yeah, no? Um, is there any way to turn off this light? No. Okay, so, uh, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, can you step back a little bit? We'll try yeah. to do our best. Um, Second. If you want control pillow. Right, so we uh, restart the service, as I m uh, previously mentioned, and then we'll run a PS instruction uh, to show all the tiny proxy uh, processes. So basically, the first one uh, is going to be the uh, uh, daemon process, and all the others are just pre forked uh, uh, processes uh, from this one uh, to handle requests. 
Uh, so we now run our exploit code, which will start uh, triggering the connect uh, requests in order to trigger the DNS queries. And as you can see in this Wireshark output, uh, we do send, uh, we do connect to the proxy a lot. Uh, specifying exploit.com as the DNS server, the, as the domain we want to get. It could have been any domain, it doesn't really matter. Um, this causes tiny proxy, uh, each and every of the child processes, uh, to send the DNS uh, requests over UDP. Uh, one uh, UDP request for the IPv4 address, uh, the A request, and another one for the IPv6. Uh, they are both sent over the same UDP socket. Um, we then reply uh, with the two main characteristics. First, we set the truncated flag to true in order to uh, restart the query again over TCP, we will later see. And we fill in the buffer in order to trigger the buffer mismanagement, basically to trigger the malloc. Uh, this is uh, not enough by uh, the... Never mind, okay, we'll just continue. Uh, <laughs> we then, uh, uh, the tiny proxy uh, restarts again over TCP, sending both an IPv4 request and an IPv6 request uh, again over the same TCP socket. Uh, which we reply now uh, with a valid response uh, for the IPv4 request, setting the attacker's IP address as the resolved uh, address for, uh, for that domain, and uh, reply again for the IPv6 uh, with a malphone packet, basically a bunch of A's, uh, until we get to the byte we enumerate. Uh, this time it happened to be a 1C, uh, and we enumerate only a single byte now. Um, so we'll now see the script output uh, shortly. Um, and as you can see, we already leaked two bytes. One C happened to be the correct byte, and another one, which is uh, 96. Um, so let's examine for, uh, for a second uh, what, where the stack is uh, using uh, cut proc maps. And as you can see, uh, this is where the stack is located. Uh, that's the base of the stack, the highest address. And uh, the other address is the limit of the stack. So, uh, basically the bytes we leaked are actually uh, reside within uh, that range. Uh, those are the least significant bytes, as uh, we recall. Uh, and Nadav, can you just fast forward a little bit? Because this takes like two minutes, uh, depending on <coughs> what bytes we got. Um, So, uh, as you can see, we did leak uh, the arbitrary address, and then, uh, you just don't see because it happened too fast, <laughs> uh, <laughs> we also leaked the stack base. Uh, the way we do that, can you stop for a second? Mm -hmm. uh, the way we do that is that we take the arbitrary pointer we leaked uh, within the stack range and align it to a page boundary, and then just uh, add uh, 1,000 hexabyte each time until we don't get a connection back, and that would be the stack base. Um, so now the stage the exploit is at is trying to leak the uh, random stack offset that the kernel generated. Uh, so Nadav, if you can continue. What we'll do now is attach with GDB to the uh, tiny proxy, to the daemon service, set a breakpoint on getADDR info, um, and set the debugger to follow fork mode child, uh, which means that we will al also attach child processes uh, of the daemon service and debug those. So we continue, and we are now within the context of the child process, uh, the newly created process, and stop it, get it here info. Uh, we'll continue again, and we will encounter a crash. Uh, the reason why is that uh, at this specific iteration, we didn't guess the correct offset. Uh, if you examine the stack trace, the crash is due to a board to raise. Uh, there are no symbols on this machine, but it happened due to the free that we showed earlier. Um, so now just continue. As you can see, the PIDs are uh, just continue and continue because we crash all the child processes all the time. Um, can you also fast forward? Uh, so now there's a nine bits enumeration uh, to get the correct uh, offset. Um, 
seconds. Yeah, this, this enumeration is usually the one that takes the most amount of time. Uh, well, but depends of what offset you got. Um, thanks. And, uh, well, we got the correct offset. This address would be actually where the alloca buffer is. Um, and we now at the stage where we try to enumerate the where the return address of get area info, uh, basically where uh, libc is. Uh, that's where libc is located. It was randomized at uh, this execution. And it's kind of hard to see, but we start to leak bytes from there. Uh, one more thing, our payload, what it does is create a new process, a new uh, file under the temp directory. So we will later see that our payload actually worked by uh, creating a new file over there. So we leaked one byte of the return address, uh, 5.7. And uh, again, we'll fast forward <laughs> a little bit. Uh, this entire exploit takes about seven to 10 minutes. Uh, but we do exploit a machine that is on the same line with us. So if it would be on the internet, it would take a little bit longer because of uh, the time we have to wait uh, for the TCP, uh, uh, TCP scene to be sent. Uh, so it could take uh, a longer time. Um, second. Thanks. Uh, so we now leaked uh, where libc is. Uh, we assumed the uh, one version of libc for this demo, but we could have just enumerated it as uh, we told you earlier, uh, and performed the rock chain, uh, which will create a new file uh, under a temp directory because that's what we executed uh, using the rock chain. Um, and this is the libc. Uh, address and there you go uh, as you can see a new file was created um, so just a quick conclusion mm. uh, security mitigations uh, can make exploitation uh, harder um, but attackers can find uh, creative ways uh, abusing OS features, uh, like for this example, for this exploitation, uh, the way the fork system call works, uh, in order, order to bypass those mitigations. Uh, what's important to note is that this technique can be applied to basically almost any memory corruption vulnerability uh, within a server uh, that uh, forks itself and operates the way we described. Uh, so how you protect yourself? Uh, basically, uh, you can use the Palo Alto network security platform that protects you against some of these threats. And more importantly, just patch your software. Basically, if Lucy is patched, uh, there will be no vulnerability. Um, so, any questions? No one? Yes. Uh, we didn't try the, the path of uh, trying to abuse the free behavior, though we did see some uh, posts about it. Uh, we thought this uh, solution will be more straightforward and simpler to implement, and it will also demonstrate uh, this attack technique. Seven to ten minutes, depending on the random and if you get lower or higher bytes for your address. Uh, we could also uh, um, improve that because we didn't uh, assume for some bytes that we knew the value of. Like for instance, some bytes are always zero, some bytes are always constant offset, the return address always ends up with the same byte, stuff like that. We did still enumerate those, uh, so we could have improved that a little bit. Uh, uh, any other questions? Uh, well, all right then, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.